Join us for a two-part interview with Elspeth Copeland, Canadian product developer turned entrepreneur and founder of EC Consulting, a business that transforms culinary passion into its standing business results by working from concept to launch and beyond. Learn what goes into creating successful food products and how to better your chances for getting your product on retailer shelves. We hope you really enjoy this interview. I think it has to start with a really good strategy. You know, what is it that you're trying to do and how are you going to be different? And I think sometimes people think that different means that it's like a rainbow colored unicorn, but it doesn't need to be. Okay, let's get into this. According to Harvard Business School professor Clayton Christensen, approximately 30,000 new products are introduced each year with 70 to 80% of those launched into the grocery channel failing to make the cut with consumers. Now, consider, if you will, a 52-week study of grocery shopping behavior that showed the average household purchases less than 1% of products already on the shelf, which in a grocery store averages 45,000 SKUs. With stores not building up more shelf space and consumers having limited attention, how can budding food entrepreneurs cut through the noise dominated by big brands in an overcrowded market? Well, not surprisingly, it starts with making a great product. And that's where Elspeth Copeland comes in. After graduating with an arts degree, Elspeth found herself working at one of the largest food service companies in the world, which eventually became the launch pad for turning a love of food into a career in product development. From humble beginnings, she would go on to lead product development programs for companies like President's Choice and Loblaws until 2010, she decided to take her experience and turn it into a consulting business that would help both startup and established food businesses create and deliver exceptional food products. Today, Elspeth has helped shape and evolve more than a thousand products across multiple categories. In part one of our interview, Elspeth will dive deeper into her story, explaining how passion overcame a lack of experience and the lessons she's learned about what it takes to create success in retail. Now, let's get to Elspeth. So I would like to welcome the amazing and talented Elspeth Copeland, who is somebody that knows more about food and what goes into producing food on a mass scale than most people ever know. So I just want to say thank you um, a ton for joining us on this issue or this episode of The Creators. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. So Elspeth, tell us um, about your background. So, uh, um, you know, start with uh, with what you studied and what led you into product development? Well, I've spent my whole career in product development. So naturally, I have a degree in politics. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> that was a joke or an attempt at a joke. Um, I kind of I kind of fell into this. Um, I always had a passion for food. Um, my whole life, my parents were sort of culinary adventurers themselves. Um, and I grew up in Montreal and, um, just food was a really big part of our life, whether it was going to restaurants or traveling to find something or my mom cooking or whatever. Um, and I, I guess I never really thought about a career in food because the only career that I understood in food was being a chef. And, um, I didn't really think that was for me. And so I went to university and, uh, ended up. Uh, getting a job, um, you know, with a with an arts degree, uh, I was pretty wide open to any opportunities and got a job uh, with a large um, food service company that had um, chains across uh, North America, and started in marketing, and um, but was really interested in what the menu planning group was doing, and ended up uh, getting a job over in the menu planning department, which in food service is essentially product development. Um, and then eventually found my way to, uh, Loblaws and President's Choice. Uh, I was given an amazing opportunity. Uh, they had an idea or the head of product development at the time had an idea that he wanted to bring in recent grads with a strong, um, business acumen and a sensibility for food and that he would train them to be product developers, which was a similar program that Marks and Spencer's uh, had in the UK. And I was fortunate, incredibly fortunate to be the guinea pig, the first one. Um, the other product developers they had were real product developers. You know, they were either food scientists or chefs or 
Um, I was, I was the first with not an official sort of background and I stayed for 17 years, which were, it was amazing because I got to work across every category in the store. And then, um, I decided to start my own business a little over 10 years ago. And, uh, now I work with, um, food manufacturers, retailers, brands, and just help people bring new products to market. So I am curious about that decision to try and to, to bring in new grads that don't have backgrounds in uh, the food area. What was the what was the rationale for doing that? I don't think, you know, and there still isn't really much in terms of formal training to be a product developer. Um, it's sort of a little bit of several disciplines. So, you know, a lot of product developers are chefs. Um, and that can be a really great career path. Um, but you need to have a little bit more understanding of food science. You need a little bit of food science uh, sort of knowledge to do product development. And often sort of that it's sort of a left brain, right brain kind of a thing. If you're really creative and want to create things as a chef, maybe you're not as interested in sort of the science uh, part of product development. Um, project management is a really important uh, part of the role and understanding business and sort of the finances of bringing a product. So I think maybe, and I'm guessing that their strategy was if we have some chefs, some food scientists, some folks with a business background, uh, some engineers, you know, if they had a little bit sort of from every, from various backgrounds, that together the product development team could be strong. Um, and, you know, uh, that was that was sort of the idea that was adopted at Loblaws. Now, a lot of the people that were hired were either food scientists with an interest in culinary or chefs who had an interest in nutrition. Um, it's not that they were deliberately looking for people without, um, you know, the a, a, a background that was compatible but they were certainly open to it. Right. Interesting. So you've been at it for 27 years now, if I do so, the math yeah. correctly. How, in, that, in that time, how many products have you helped develop and bring to market? Like thousands, thousands and thousands. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I was at Lomas for 17 years, and as a product developer, your product plan for the year would, you know, easily have well over 100 products, maybe close to 200 products. Now, that's not necessarily 200 brand new products. We divided it into different sort of sections. So it could be a product improvement. Um, it could be a new supplier, you know, where for whatever reason, a supplier could no longer make the product. So you need to match it somewhere else. Could be a brand new innovation, the align extension. Um, you know, it could be any any number of things. So some products would be product development intense, and others would be a little bit of a lighter touch. But um, yeah, and then and in my consulting business, yeah, I work on, you know, probably at least fifty to sixty new products a year. I would guess. I never really stop and count them. <laughs> Maybe I should. Wow. Wow, I'm just I'm thinking right now how many meals I've eaten in my lifetime that you've had your hands all over. Quite frightening, actually. So, <laughs> well, it's fun to walk. It's fun to walk a grocery so you store and, I had, and be like, you know, I remember creating that or the supplier who was that. Did that? Or, did that? Yeah. Had that? Yeah. It, yeah. Now you know the reason I'm so excited to talk to you is because obviously food is something that gets a lot of people excited. Food is something that a lot of people relate to. You know, in the area of entrepreneurs, you know, food is one of these these things that seems to come up a lot. When people say, oh, I'd love to start a business and I've got a great food idea, it's, it's pretty common. And so what, what's interesting about your background, of course, is that you've, you've worked the front line. You've had to, you know, wear the hat of a retailer and say, what do I think customers are going to buy here? And I'm curious, I know that this is a big question, but I'm just curious, like, if you were to boil it down to its simple ingredients, what is it that goes into making a product successful? Well, I think it has to start with a really good strategy. 
um, you know, what is it that you're trying to do and how are you going to be different? And I think sometimes people think that different means that it's like a rainbow colored unicorn, but it doesn't need to be like, it can be, that is <laughs> it different can be, though. it that can is be, different though. um, you know, unique in value, unique in recipe, a unique concept. Um, but I think you just need to have a strat, a good strategy. And part of a, a really good strategy is understanding who else is doing something similar and how you're going to stack up against them. I often find entrepreneurs have a great idea, but they're so focused on their idea. They haven't looked outwards to see what else is in the market and see how they compare, um, you know, how they compare packaging wise, how they compare taste wise, how they compare value wise, um, convenience wise. Um, and so I think, I think strategy is probably, you know, it's the starting point. And if you don't have a good strategy, then your chances for success are probably quite slim. I mean, every now and then people get lucky, but, and then I would say, and, yeah. And then I would no, say go ahead, please. consistency is really key. I mean, consumers expect when they buy a product to have the exact same experience every single time. And so creating sort of engineering a product so that consumers can have that consistent experience is really important because if you have a bad day and you produce a product that's not on standard, that's really not what you intended to put in the market, but it gets into the market and a consumer buys it and they hate it. Well, they don't think, well, they had a bad day. It was, you know, they forgot an ingredient in the recipe. They think, this is a product I don't like. I'm not going to buy it again. And so consistency is really key. And it's really, uh, it's challenging for startups to, you know, to um, make a product in an environment where they will have consistency because that tends to be more sophisticated manufacturers, larger manufacturers. And so that's a challenge for, for new entrepreneurs. And then, um, sorry, and then I think the third thing would be that Often entrepreneurs, I find, have an idea for a product. And um, it's just too difficult to get a product to market. And it's just not a, it's not a sustainable business model. So I, I really encourage entrepreneurs to think about a range of products and a family of products. So, you know, let's not just talk about this one sauce. Like, how could that how could that grow and expand into a full-fledged business? Because, you know, the chance of you um, making a living off of one sauce, um, as an example, is is probably also pretty slim. That's interesting. And, of course, there's an issue that you and I have talked about a lot over the years is this idea that when you go into a typical grocery store, now, we're, you know, the one caveat I'll place on this. We're, we're now in an era where a lot of consumers are, or sorry, a lot of brands are going around traditional retail channels and going direct to consumer. But I was going to say, you know, the reality is when you go into a grocery store, those shelves are typically mm -hmm. dominated by big brands, you know, and, and a lot of them aren't great. So I'm curious about this idea that if you're an entrepreneur and you've developed a product and you think it's exceptional, you think it's exceptional, how do you, what's the mindset of the retailer like, you know, or the category manager? How do you actually get through to them with an idea and convince them to put your, put your product in the shelf? <laughs> um, I think, you know, in any situation, you need to think about who your audience is and what their key drivers are. And generally, if you think about a category manager at a store, you know, working for a retail chain, their job is to make sure that their shelf space is as profitable as possible. Their job is to bring in the dollars for the retailer. And so as a consumer, you walk into a store and you, you think you're walking into one store. But, but the reality, if you really think about it, is you're walking into like 50 little tiny stores because every shelf segment is being managed 
by a category manager who's trying to make that set deliver the most profit for the business that they possibly can. And they're incentivized on it, right? The more profitability they bring to their corner of the shelf, um, you know, the more they're compensated. It's a strong business model. Entrepreneurs who are focused on a unique product or a great tasting product often um, communicate the benefits of their products around flavor versus around profitability. That's what the category manager is most interested in. So it may be a really great product, but how is it going to deliver profitability to their bottom line? Or how is it going to encourage more people to go into that set? into that part of the store. And I think focusing um, the conversation with that lens uh, will probably help help drive um, some interest. And I think um, it's often very difficult for an unknown brand to, uh, you know, approach a multi-unit retailer. They're looking for sort of proof of concept they may, may be less willing to take a risk on something that's completely unknown. I mean, there's lots of examples of retailers that do take risks, you know, like Costco takes risks all the time. Trader Joe's takes risks. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of retailers that do, but generally the larger ones, they want to see proof of concept. So where are you selling now? How many units do you move a week? What is the profitability? Um, so I think. You know, often the goal is to get into a very large retailer because that's where the volume is. But I encourage entrepreneurs to 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 kind of think about a staged approach to market where you um, where you can grow your volume as you sort of hone your skills and improve your product. So you don't kind of just jump in two feet and, you know, you're selling to 2000 stores. Um, you know, start with a focus on maybe, you know, two key ones in your market and grow to 10 and then grow to 40 and then grow to 100, like have a staged approach to get it to market. Because then as you go to the next stage, you have more and more data around proof of concept and how your product will improve profitability for that next sort of tier of retailer. I think that is massive advice. In fact, so much of what you said, I think, so much of what you just said there, I, I think is something that people really do take for granted. Um, there's a saying in, in writing that you've got to be able to, or be willing to kill your darlings. And I think in entrepreneur, in the entrepreneurial area, it's the same thing that you can mm -hmm. fall in love with what you're doing and not look critically enough at it. And what, What's interesting is, you know, you've been given a recipe from your grandmother and everybody loves it who tries it. Um, and what you're saying is that's fine, but the gatekeeper is somebody who's purely looking yeah. at this the from a strategic standpoint. The consumer cares about, the consumer might be interested in your grandmother's recipe and, you know, where the, you know, where the garlic came from and what variety it is. But the, but the store buying your product is most interested in how many pennies it'll put in the till. That's what they're, that's, you know, that's how they keep the lights on. That's how they, that's how they manage their business. And so, yeah, speaking to them on their terms, I think is really important. Yeah. So can you describe, uh, again, I guess in a way for an entrepreneur, this is not, this is not second nature, you know, and your advice that is going to be really valuable. They've got to get their head in the business of business as much as in the business of loving their product, if they're going to be effective at trying to get a product to market through traditional retail. Now, but as somebody that lives this and breathes this every day, can you just describe, you know, how does your how how does your innovation process work? How do you conceptualize a new product? Just give us kind of the high level of what what is your um, process. It's interesting because I think I I think that the general I mean, not many people know what product development is or food product development is, but I think people generally think that product developers sort of sit around and dream up new products based on, you know, what the cool new things are. Like the reality of my business is that 
for the most part, I'm meeting people who have an idea and aren't really sure how to get it to market or have, in the case of manufacturers, have equipment that's underutilized and they're looking for a product that would fit that equipment so that they can grow their sales. Or they have a brand that's stagnant and they are looking to increase their sales or expand, like expand their reach. And so, you know, a lot of the, you know, I would say it's probably 50% of the time I'm helping someone realize their dream. And 50% of the time I'm helping an organization Mm -hmm. create new products, but that fit into a very specific guideline. You know, so for example, you know, a company could come to me and say like, you know, what are the latest trends? What should we be working on? But we're vegan, gluten-free, soy-free, non-GMO project, organic, you know, no sugar. You know, so so it's not like this huge world of what what's the coolest and latest. It it usually has to fit into some kind of parameter. Like, what are the latest trends and what's going on that we can make with this Susie? What's it piece of equipment that we have that we aren't using enough? So it's kind of like looking at the broader you know food trends and what consumers are interested in, and then very quickly like diving into what it means to that business and and what can they execute for that business. It's very different if you're an entrepreneur and you're just starting out, you can kind of start with anything. You can start with inspiration from that recipe from your grandmother or a dish that you had at a restaurant that you loved or a particular line of products that you've always been interested in. Like the world is much more sort of open, um, but generally work with organizations for me at least is They have sort of something specific in mind and I'm helping them sort of trying to get there. So obviously a lot has changed uh, in the last, or certainly my observation is it seems a lot has changed in the last 10 or 15 years. It seems that there are more interesting products that are coming to market led by retailers like Loblaws or Marks and Spencer and others out there. Um, What are the big changes that you've seen happen in that period? And how much of that is being shaped by the consumer? Um, I think the most important change in the last probably five, three to five years is the speed at which trends sort of take off and either explode into fireworks or fizzle out very, very quickly. Um, you know, it used to be that you could, you know, kind of look, you know, sit back and have a look and be like, Hmm, you know, based on all these things I'm seeing and reading and looking in the stores, like, I think this is the trend for next year. And maybe this is the trend a little bit further out. And now things can go from like never being heard of to being, uh, all everyone is talking about, uh, in a matter of days, thanks to you know, social media. And so trying, I think Mm. now the challenge is trying to figure out which trends will consumers that will keep their attention. So a lot of things get their attention, but but what will keep their attention? And so what's worth sort of pursuing as a product? Um, You know, during, during COVID, um, a lot of trends were happening in social media, things like TikTok and Instagram. And, you know, I remember there was, you know, for like a whole 48 hours, maybe the trend was Dalgona coffee and everyone was making, you know, this, Mm -hmm. this, uh, this special coffee. And there were all these videos and pictures. And so like some clients of mine were like, Oh, we, we need to do like a Dalgona coffee, like, you know, something like a cheesecake or I don't know. Um, something. And then now people are like Dalgona who like that was, you know, uh, it's like it was here and it's gone. And that's Mm. always been a challenge with trends, trying to figure out what will stick, what will keep consumers attention and what will just sort of fizzle out. But that pace of sort of what's coming at us and what we need to assess, um, it's just faster and faster all the time. So I think, I think that's a huge challenge, uh, in terms of figuring out what, what resonates. I'm really interested in 
Yeah, and I was uh, I was going to go there as my next question because again, this is something that you and I have talked about. You know, five years, hundred years after the fact, almost we're still reading Shakespeare. You know, and we still relate to very you know the human certain truths in our humanity are consistent over time, even though the world changes. And so I'm curious from a food standpoint, it seems the same way. Like, you know, there must be, what are the threads or are there threads that make, that are consistently successful? And in a way, and maybe another way to frame that is, are there things that are almost inbuilt that consumers respond to and that should be adhered to as Um, you're thinking about a product? I think that consumers like new things, but things that aren't too new. And so um, I think if you take a product and you come up with a new version or an improvement or a unique, uh, you know, a unique version of that product, I think it's always better to change one, maybe two things than to change many more than that. Because consumers like things that are familiar with a little bit of a twist. You know, they don't like things that are that are really way out there. Um, they may like to experiment with them, but you know, the you know, the volume in food is getting people to purchase a product regularly, um, that have it be part of their weekly shop not have it be something that they buy sort of as a novelty or like as a once or twice a year kind of a thing. And so the kinds of products like from since I started my career to now are the kinds of products where it's new, something something about a product is new, but it's not a completely, completely crazy concept that is unfamiliar to people. So I'm trying to think of an example. Um, Um, I'm trying to think of something that would, that, that would, so, you know, one of the most successful plant-based launches, um, was just food doing plant-based mayonnaise. So, you know, this was before beyond and impossible. Um, and they did so well, they became the number one selling mayonnaise in most major retailers across the U S. Um, yeah, and Hellman's tried to uh, tried to get them not to be able to call their product Mayo because it didn't comply to the standard of identity, and they launched a lawsuit against um, Just Mayo, and uh, there was such outcry. Poor little Just Mayo, they're just trying to make plant-based mayonnaise. Don't bully them, but they actually ended up dropping the suit. But, I mean, that example is... It's mayonnaise. Like we're all pretty familiar with mayonnaise, but they made a plant-based version of it. You know, they didn't do like um like um a sesame soy kimchi mayonnaise <laughs> or spread. They just they just did mayonnaise and they did it plant-based. So that, you know, it's just an example of if you want to try something new, try it you know, add a twist on something that's familiar, that those are the kinds of products that tend to, in my experience, anyway, that tend to sort of um, be able to scale and have the most volume. I hope you enjoyed the first part of our interview with Elspeth Copeland, founder of EC Consulting. Click on the second part of our interview to hear Elspeth's thoughts on why large companies with access to research and capital fail in the face of smaller competitors and what she's excited about in the future of product development.